Greetings of the day. Uh, in this video, we shall discuss about the airway assessment and management of uh, post extubation strider. So, careful airway assessment and uh, management is paramount for anticipated extubation success, right? So, often the clinician considering the extubation was not present during the patient's initial presentation. Before proceeding to with any extubation, all the initial intubation documentation and airway evaluation should be reviewed to prepare for potential exposed extubation complications. For example, documentation of the presence of the edema uh, before intubation informs the clinician that this condition was not a result of presence of endotracheal intubation, endotracheal tube. Resolution of the pre-existing edema should occur before extubation. Of note, ET uh, intub uh, inducted, induced, sorry. I'm really sorry. Of note, ED induced laryngeal edema usually occurs after the first 36 hours. And this is usually greater than the average length of the stay in an ED. The cuff leak test uh, is used to predict post extubation strider and is a surrogate, mother, uh, surrogate marker of the laryngeal edema. To perform a cuff leak test, first document the patient's inspiratory and expiratory volume uh, before ED tube cuff deflation on the volume control invasive mechanical ventilation while on volume control invasive mechanical ventilation the tidal volume should be temporarily should be updated to 8 to 10 millimeter ml of uh, milliliters of per kg ideal body weight as lowered at tidal volume may fail to show cuff leak when one is pressure okay so after et tube is deflated the difference between inhaled and exhaled tidal volume represents the cuff leak okay or volume lost around the tube the volume of air loss should be more than 110 ml so cuff leak can be measured by an audible leak or volume loss approximately more than 24 percent of tidal volume a smaller absent cuff leak volume less than 110 ML suggests laryngeal edema and is associated with an increased risk of post extubation strider and respiratory distress. Risk factors for post extubation laryngeal edema include traumatic intubation, intubation more than six days, large ED, female sex, re and re intubation after unplanned extubation. So, this is the risk factor. These are the risk factors that traumatic intubation, intubation more than six days, then large endotracheal ET tube, then female sex and reintubation after unplanned extubation. Without these factors, the patient can be deemed low risk and extubated without CL risk of leak assessment. Okay, higher risk patients may benefit from the cuff leak test and if present, likely safe to extubate. If cuff leak is absent, initiation of uh, IV glucocorticoid therapy may reduce edema and reduce the risk for post extubation strider. It is important to note that the absence of the cuff leak does not necessarily diagnose laryngeal edema. An oversized ET relative to the cross sectional area of the patient's trachea or secretions around the deflated can also cause. Uh, you know the negative cuff leak test, right? So ultimately, ED extubation should be avoided in patients with suspected laryngeal edema or airway trauma. Um, peri intubation laryngeal um, injury should be viewed with great caution and avoided when selecting for ED extubation. It is difficult for difficult if a difficult airway was noted on the initial intubation. Patient may not be appropriate for. Uh, ED extubation. If the decision is made to proceed with the extubation, the appropriate difficult airway equipment should be readily available at the bedside along with the detailed reintubation plan that is discussed with the ED, ED, team, ED team before extubation. Right? So, and also coming to the post extubation strider management. Unfortunately, even low risk patients may experience post extubation strider. Prompt assessment and management is necessary to avoid additional morbidity. First, all equipment, including difficult airway equipment and medications for potential reintubation, should be readily available for all extubations. Strider management generally involves administration of the nebulized epinephrine and IV steroids. The combination of steroids and epinephrine can reduce laryngeal edema by anti inflammatory and vasoconstriction mechanisms, respectively. So, uh, steroids reduce the inflammatory and epinephrine causes vasoconstriction. 
So consider imagined reintubation if the patient is in severe respiratory stress or if the stride does not improve after one to two hours after treatment. Before reintubation, a direct airway assessment via nasopharyngeal laryngoscopy. Okay. Uh, this may identify cause for airway obstruction. However, this may be difficult in a patient with significant respiratory stress. Potential etiologies that are refractory to steroids and epinephrines can be identified. That is, such as vocal cord paralysis and laryngeal lesions can be identified, and reintubation can be considered based on findings. Uh, so this. So the recommended pharmacological treatment for the uh, the post extubation stridor is steroids methylprednisolone 40 to 125 milligrams IV every 6 to 8 hourly, dexamethasone 5 mg IV every 6 hourly, every 6 hours, okay, 5 mg, and nebulized epinephrine 5 to 10 ml of undiluted code epinephrine, that is 0.1 mg per ml, that is 1 is to 10,000, uh, 0.5 ml of uh, 2.25 racemic epinephrine diluted in volume of 2 to 4 ml. Okay, can be nebulized. So, so before we must do a assessment, a reintubation, we must assess for any if at all patient develops the laryngeal edema and also stridor does not improve after one to two hours after treatment. And if the patient is in severe respiratory distress, then reintubation can be considered. But before that, we must do a nasopharyngeal laryngoscopy that may identify the cause. Okay. Thank you very much.